they're 100% responsible and I'm 100% responsible because you can't really pull the two apart. Uh, uh, similarly, when the paper bombs, they're 100% responsible and I'm 100% responsible because there's an interaction. You know, I don't bring in a co-author if they can't make the paper better. But what percent better? I mean, honest to God. That, but that shows our decomposable mindset that anyone would even imagine asking that particular question. Here is where I think we might end up going with uh, complexity, and, and I, I put example only in red here because uh, I certainly did. <laughs> this is not a hypothesis testing. I just wanted to show the types of things we might be looking at. Uh, you know, I think that as you deal with things that are becoming, you know, if things are familiar, not terribly rugged, and and uh, not terribly complicated, well, that's the world of end user computing. You know, let the end users build those things. On the other hand, when you have something that's complicated, but you've got a clear end zone to target, then that's where routine information systems tend to be. Uh, when you get something that's complicated and it's familiar, but it is, uh, uh, but there are lots of possible outcomes. There's not necessarily a best answer. That's the domain that artificial intelligence and so forth. My belief is that if we, you know, if we chart these things out, we might be able to come out with a reasonable typology that's that's that that's useful maybe you know 50 percent of the time uh, the point is that if we look at complexity in informing systems complexity can have a big impact on uh, the way an informing system looks and if you look at the foundations of informing science book which was published in 2009 where we tried to pull together uh, a bunch of the sort of uh, seminal research and emerging research from um, our field, one of the things that we found at the end was that, you know, when people were dealing with complex systems, they tended to use a very different set of research methods and a very different set of uh, um, hypotheses than people dealing with, you know, simple systems. Uh, and that when I say <laughs> simple, they could be very complicated, but there was always a clear endpoint, so they weren't very rugged. So, that's you know some of where some of this research is going. So what's my wish list? Where would I love the field to go? Well, today uh, you know it sometimes feels as if you know all the disciplines have ganged up on us uh, to, to fire rocks at informing science. Now it's not just paranoia on my part. The fact is, as a transdiscipline, we run into a lot of disadvantages. Uh, we violate a lot of unwritten rules. First off, because we have so many different disciplines represented in our journals, it is extremely difficult for us to achieve a high journal ranking in any one discipline. Uh, and when we do, it's usually accidental. Informing Science was, was ranked as an A journal uh, in a uh, survey of uh, German and Aust uh, Austrian uh, journals, uh, a fairly important ranking uh, for the universities. However, we were, it was purely a result of an extremely flawed methodology that we ended up that way, but I was delighted. Meanwhile, we were struggling to get a D ranking in Australia, so uh, <laughs> the point is, you know, when less than half of your stuff comes out of any discipline, they're not going to rank you very high as an outlet. In addition, because we're so tolerant of different research methods, we are going to get lots and lots of submissions that people from one discipline or another will say, this isn't research. Uh, you know, people look at a story, and, oh, this isn't research. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have seen this happen many times. The first time I submitted to the ISIS con conference, I submitted a, a totally uh, new idea, an idea that had not been presented anywhere before, and I tried to explain it in the paper. And I still remember this one review. This is a wonderful tutorial, but it's not research. Well, that's because that type of thing, it just wouldn't be considered research in MIS, but it would be considered research in other areas. And so one of the things that we do is we publish a lot of things that folks look at and say, that's not research. 
Similarly, whenever you compare the assumptions of one discipline to another, you can run into problems because they are often completely inconsistent. My favorite example of this is the field of economics and the field of management. If you look at the field of economics, the individual is basically assumed to be a genius who will consistently maximize utility, uh, knows exactly what he or she wants and produces, you know, comes to an absolute peak of utility. Now, on the other hand, if you look at the field of management, the assumption is that the typical management is a complete idiot and needs to be told things such as, well, the usefulness of a system will make us more motivated to use it. And as a consequence, uh, if you try to put the assumptions of these two fields together, you're going to get a lot of friction because neither assumption works very well, but, but they are conflicting assumptions. And this is a problem you have whenever you merge fields. So what we should be striving for is to become this sort of orchestrator of these different fields, taking contributions from each field and offering contributions to each field with the view of expanding perspectives. Another thing that we need to do is we need to make our communications more effective at informing other people. Honest to God, when you read most research these days, you must be, at least I am convinced that the sole purpose that the author had in mind was to confuse the editor and the reviewers. Uh, you know, we make the stuff so complicated and so convoluted that it is nearly impossible for a layman to read it or even an expert outside that narrow discipline. And one of the challenges of this is in informing science, we cannot accept that. Uh, when we get a submission, we, I can't understand this, we got to send it back and say, this is probably a really good idea, but I have no idea because I've got no clue as to what you said. So if you wouldn't mind, pr please express it in a way that I can understand it. You know, use examples. <laughs> Make it something that can be a form of information exchange because the principal objective of informing science should be to allow us to exchange information and ideas between different disciplines. And we cannot do that by limiting ourselves to the jargon of our own discipline and by um, trying to convince everyone how brilliant we are by making stuff that no mortal can understand. To be really interesting, something has to be simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional, and it has to be built around stories. And stories are one of the most effective ways we have of informing other people. Now, the problem is, in a lot of disciplines, well, a story is not considered uh, research, even if it's nonfiction, it's not considered research. And my argument is, well, we got to start thinking about informing as being a part of research because if it is not a part of research, then the work that we do serves no conceivable purpose. Exploring alternative perspectives. One of the things we have to be is extremely tolerant of other perspectives. Just as um, this illustration here shows the... Uh, I got this from Eli once again. This is the, you know... For people who have read the story of the six blind men and the elephant, each blind man felt a different part of the elephant and came to a different conclusion. So the people f uh, feeling the legs thought it was a tree, feeling the trunk thought it was a snake, feeling the tusk thought it was a spear, and so forth. This is a very nice illustration. We saw an example of that today. For example, when I look at this, I see webbed feet and an aquatic bill, so I include, I conclude duck, maybe, or goose. But Eli's perspective is that it's a chicken. And, <laughs> and I am not going to contradict Eli. I will simply offer a different perspective. What we need to do, <laughs> what we need to do here is 
Also, reach out to other disciplines. Uh, I remember when I got started in, in informing science very early on, I read this, uh, you know, consider submitting your best work to informing science. And believe me, I'd love to get your best work. Or frankly, I'd love to get it, practically any of your work. Just, you know, <laughs> make it readable, make it informing. We'll, we'll help, we'll mentor the heck out of you uh, to get it published. But, uh, I believe it is equally important for us to spread the word in other disciplines and go out and talk about informing science within the various disciplines in which you work. And uh, in March, Eli and I attended a conference which was, <laughs> you know, which it was nice. Eli didn't have to organize it, but it was basically a, a conference called uh, academic informing science in engineering. And uh, Na Naguib Kalios, uh, who was uh, involved very early with the informing science field, but has since then been working uh, principally with another group uh, operating out of Venezuela, got so intrigued with some of the notions uh, of informing science uh, that were presented in a, in a book uh, that he decided to organize an entire symposium around it. I consider that type of work very, very important because if informing science is to be a success, we have to get other disciplines to learn about it and we are not going to get that to happen simply by publishing within our own sub-collections of journal. The last thing that we want to do is create our own little silo within this field. Fortunately, I think it's very unlikely that we will ever get a silo here. In fact, you know, it's, it's, it's unlikely that we'll ever understand what everyone else is doing, but our objective should be to try. So, that is the end of my presentation. I don't know if I have any time left for questions. Apparently, I probably ran over, but thank you very much, and I'll look forward to speaking with you in the conference.